Muse from the Borderland. This is EPAS Unleashed. Hi everyone, welcome to EPAS Unleashed. I'm your host, Jessica Navarro, and today we have a very special guest. Many of our shelter workers are fans of this guest, so we're really excited and honored to have her on. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, training, and uh, before we dive into that that topic, um, we'll go ahead and do a little intro with uh, Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> no, thank you for being here. Um, so for our listeners, I feel like a lot of uh, people in animal welfare know, know you, but um, for our li listeners that might not know you, can we get a little bit uh, of an intro uh, about you? Yeah, so my name is Jenna Pellerito. Um, I've been working with dogs for about 10 years, but going on my seventh year of being like a trainer or a behavior specialist. Um, I started in doggy daycare, was initially a pooper scooper, basically. And then I just like worked <laughs> up to being like a head handler in the groups and all of that. Um, quickly became certified um, in dog training just because I thought it was really interesting. And then of course, like moved on to working in shelters and now own a business as a behavior specialist. So I, I work um, pretty high level behavior modification cases. Awesome, awesome. And um, what what made you want to start working in this in this field? I know you said you started as a like a pooper scooper, but um, <laughs> what what made you want to yeah. um, pursue this? Um, I just always really loved animals and just really loved dogs. Um, and I honestly just got I like applied for this job at the kennel, not thinking that I would get it and then ended up getting it. Um, and then when I wanted to become a dog trainer and I was going through school for that, I was required to volunteer in a shelter to like uh, become a certified dog trainer. Um, and then that's basically what got me into animal welfare. It's just the fact that I was kind of, I had to go volunteer and then uh, was just like thrown into it just from that alone. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a lot of our, our um, volunteers, uh, that happens to them too. They, you know, start yep. off volunteering because they need it for whatever reason and then they end up loving it and they just stay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, to kind of jump into to the training, um, of course, again, this, maybe this is something that people in, in animal welfare know, but uh, our listeners not might might not be aware of it. But um, can we talk a little bit about force free training? So, yep. So um, I am, of course, a force free dog trainer. <laughs> so what yep. that means, um, basically, force free dog training is a style of training where we're not using force or fear or pain, intimidation, punishment, corrections, anything like that um, as a behavior modification strategy. So like, yes, those types of things do exist in the world and we can't really avoid them. We don't have to use them as a way to modify behavior. Um, so we're using primarily positive reinforcement to strengthen behaviors that we want the dogs to do or we want to see. Um, we typically are applying some form of a management tactic to prevent the behaviors we don't want to see. Um, and more cases than not, we're not only just using positive reinforcement by itself, but it's typically a mix of systematic desensitization, counter conditioning as well, especially if it's like a behavior modification case. Um, but really, we are primarily working on on ensuring that the dog is opting in to the process, um, that they're essentially consenting to the process, that they want to be doing it, and we give them a choice in it as well. Um, so it's as positive as we can make it, and it should be really fun and really rewarding for everybody involved. Yeah, and I that's so amazing because, you know, here at the shelter, we uh, do see animals that come from different, you know, backgrounds. And I, we know here that force free training is so important, especially like in the shelter life. So um, it's it's really uh, something that we want to talk more about for our community to kind of um, have in, in their mind and, and hopefully practice at home as well. <laughs> um, and you mentioned positive reinforcement. Can we talk a little bit about um, what that is? 
Yep, so positive reinforcement, positive means the addition of. So when we're thinking about all of the quadrants in the sense of like positive, negative punishment, positive, negative reinforcement, positive means to add. And then um, reinforcement is just going to strengthen the behavior. So when we positively reinforce the behavior, um, we are basically telling the learner or the dog to like do that again. Um, so it's just the addition of something the learner or the dog wants, um, and it's going to make that behavior happen more often. We'll strengthen it. Um, it's kind of like going into work and getting a paycheck. Most people go to work and keep going to work because they're getting paid <laughs> to go to work. <laughs> so it's kind of, that's like a really easy, easy example of positive reinforcement is just like what motivates you to go to work. And most people are like, because I get a paycheck. And that's that's quite literally all it is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Some of us are lucky. I mean, I love working. So I, I love being here for the animals and stuff. But yeah. I definitely would maybe like it a little less if I wasn't getting a paycheck. So <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, and can we talk a little bit about um, aversive methods and uh, why we shouldn't use them? So aversive methods are essentially any tool or tactic that is inherently aversive or punishing or uncomfortable to the dog. So um, when we're thinking on a spectrum of like positive punishment, um, punishment is working. So the learner or the dog is avoiding that stimulus. Um, so typically an aversive tool is something like an e-collar, prong collar, slip lead. Of course, any tool can be aversive. Um, just your voice or your hands can be aversive. But aversive tools inherently typically Typically are going to be an e collar or a prong collar because those things are like designed to be aversive. Um, and then typically we don't want to use them. Um, research indicates basically recently that um, there are higher level levels of stress um, and aggression and fear when dogs or any species really are experiencing punishment or aversive tools in their day to day life. Um, it's also linked to chronic stress and decreased responsiveness. So it's really just not worth the risk, in my opinion, to be constantly doing that to an animal. Um, also, especially in the sheltering world, like the dogs are already extremely stressed. Um, they're yeah. typically in a new place. In more cases than not, they're in severe levels of pain too. A lot of dogs come in with injuries or pre-existing conditions that they're already uncomfortable. They're terrified. Um, we really don't want to be slapping more aversive things onto them when they're already so uncomfortable and so stressed out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we know it here that these these pets are just not their their normal self because of how loud the noises are here, how the noise level is, um, you know, people coming in and out and uh, disturbing their sleep. And, you know, it's it's just a really stressful environment to be in the shelter. So um, adding that is is definitely not something that that we want to do. Um, and I I mainly work with kiddos. I, I'm the education coordinator. So I, I usually go wow. out and I'm talking to kids, um, yeah. teaching them, you know, hopefully to to be better in animal welfare um, for the future. Um, but we always talk about, um, do we think that pets have feelings? And I ask them, do you guys like being stressed? Or do you like to to be anxious? Um, and you know, of course, most of the time, the kids are going to be like, Oh, no, I don't like feeling that I don't like feeling that. So I, I link that to Okay, well, why would you want your doggy to feel like that uh, yeah. why would you want your your pet to feel like that um so i that's you know something that that i definitely always have in my mind too i don't want to make my my pet stressed if i can help yeah. it i'm gonna make them feel everything that i want to feel <laughs> oh, yeah. And something I always mention too is that behavior is communication. So like dogs specifically like cannot talk to us. They can't be like, hey, I feel this way or hey, my leg hurts or this is happening. Um, so when they are behaving, whether it's a behavior that we like or not, they're communicating with us. So then when we're punishing that behavior and saying, hey, don't do that, then they're just like, oh, well, then they can't communicate with us at that point. Um, even like low level aggression or reactivity can be a pain response by itself. Um, so especially with, with those types of cases, we don't want to be taking away a dog's ability to communicate with us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, like you said, they, they don't speak English or Spanish or any other language that we understand. So yeah. um, they, they show us with their body or with, you know, their, their emotions. So it's definitely important that we, like you said, don't um, restrain them from doing that. Um, here in El Paso, we do have a, a lot of um, 
that alpha mentality. Um, can we talk a little bit? <laughs> maybe maybe where, where you are too. I, I don't know. Yeah. But we have it all a big issue here with that. <laughs> It's definitely everywhere because it was so popularized, um, given like reality TV um, and all of that. Um, but dominance theory and like alpha theory, that whole thing was debunked in the early 2000s. I don't know the exact year, honestly. Um, I want to say like 2006, maybe or 2008 um, by Dr. David Meck, who created the theory so it's like it's not accurate by any means even if it maybe was accurate dogs are also not wolves so it's like doesn't really it's not relevant whatsoever um but yeah the theory was originally on captive wolves that didn't know each other whatsoever so it was just like random wolves that they took from the wild and put together um and they were primarily fighting over resources like food and water um, whereas typically like wild wolves, the hierarchy has to do with just the family members. So typically like the alpha wolf, if you will, is just typically the oldest, strongest wolf. So it's like the father, if you think of it that way. Um, and that's quite literally how they create a hierarchy. It has nothing to do with, with fighting for resources or establishing it by themselves. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important for um, people to understand that the own, the doctor who created this whole, you know, theory is is saying, no, I was wrong. <laughs> yes, yeah. I actually have, um, I have a big page on my website that's like talking about force free dog training and all of that. And I have like his video link that, of him debunking it. <laughs> like just to, to, because it is like it's, I do of course get a lot of clients who, are pretty educated and, and pretty understanding of like modern things. But I still always do get some clients who are like, yeah, my dog thinks they're alpha. And it's like, and I'm just like, oh, okay, cool. Tell me more about that just so that I can get some information. Um, and then slowly teach them like, that's probably not what's happening. Uh, it's, it's probably something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same, same here. We, you know, we hear it all the time and, um, same as you do. Oh, tell me a little bit more about this, just so that I can <laughs> inform you about what is really going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I just think it's all it's important that um, you know people know that the oh the doctor who said that this theory you know yeah. came to be is the same one trying so hard to be like no I'm I was yeah. wrong and I think that's so important admitting you're wrong and I at least commend him for doing that <laughs> yeah I know he has mentioned that like he fully regrets even doing all of that and like he said that his large majority of time that he spends in his career is just telling people that it's actually not an accurate theory whatsoever um, I mean, but I think it it still gets so much traction because of the fact that training and behavior is an unregulated field. So there are dog trainers or behavior specialists or whatever they want to call themselves that have zero certifications to back that up. They just kind of are making up whatever they want as they go. So I think that alone is like, it's just continuing to, to build that because there are so many dog trainers who are still saying that it's accurate when it's not. It's just because they, they are maybe not as educated. Yes. And I, I think that is also a really important point is there are no regulations. So, you know, somebody could go watch a YouTube channel on alpha training and they're, I'm certified. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. I always compare it to like being a hairdresser. Like, oh, I style my hair every day, but that like doesn't make me a hairstylist or like I brush my teeth. I'm not a dentist. Because there are a lot of, there's a lot of dog trainers that like just have had a dog and they're like, oh yeah, I trained my dog. I can now consult everybody else how to do it. And it's just really inaccurate and not the right thing to be doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I've been at the shelter for five years, and I would not consider myself a dog trainer. I, I, I mean, people come up to me and they ask me all the time, how do I do this? How do I, how do I make my dog do this? And I mean, I have some education, but I by no means I would call myself a dog trainer. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, you did mention that you uh, work with uh, reactive dogs or aggressive dogs. Can we talk about a little bit about the difference between those two? The difference between reactivity and aggression? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Those are like the large majority of my cases. I became a specialist because I was just like every case I was getting was that. So, and then I was just like, oh, okay, I guess I might as well specialize in this. Um, but uh, how I like to explain it is that 
aggression is intent to do harm or attempt to do harm, if you will. So an aggression case is going to be a dog who is, is, has either bitten somebody or another dog or whatever it might be, or is attempting to bite another dog. And body language is of course going to look a whole lot different. With a reactivity case, uh, it's, it's typically just exactly as it sounds, the dog is reacting to a certain stimulus. Um, and the reactions can come from, sometimes can be coming from a place of a aggression. So we can sometimes have a dog who is highly reactive to a certain stimulus, such as a dog. And the, the reason that they are reactive is because they are aggressive. And then of course, there's other reasons as to maybe why they're aggressive. Um, but with a lot of reactivity cases, it's a lot of just barking and noise and they're frustrated and maybe they are showing their teeth, maybe they are lunging. Um, a lot a lot of that behavior is just due to either frustration or fear or stress. Um, a lot of it just comes from the fact of they can typically see a stimulus like a dog or a person and they can't access that said stimulus because they're on a leash or they're behind a door or whatever it might be. Um, so then of course frustration easily builds and then they are reacting. And I like to always think of it as like if they are displaying really high levels of like lunging or like maybe they look quote unquote aggressive in some way, um, but they actually aren't aggressive. They're just reactive. It's a lot of that aggression is just due to the fact that they are stuck. Like they can't, they can't move forward. Um, so they're not actually aggressive. They're just upset that they can't go forward or they can't access said thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's really important like for the community to know the difference between the two, just because, oh, yeah. you know, like you said, it, there's, there's, um, you know, a dog that is barking and automatically the person's like, oh, he's, he's aggressive. Um, yeah. And no, usually they're just reacting to something like you said. Yeah. And sometimes dogs who are reactive could be reacting out of like, a, almost like a positive emotion. Like they're very excited mm -hmm. and they're very happy. Um, and their body language shows that maybe, but, um, or maybe it doesn't. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But regardless, the the underlying emotion that's causing it is like, they're excited. And like, they want to say hi to the people or the dog. So they're like, just like barking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I have one of those dogs, man. He, uh, not, <laughs> yeah, not to help him either. He's, he's pretty, he's a large, large dog. Um, and he's an all black dog. So he looks very scary, of course, when he's when he's barking. Uh, and every time I have to let people know, like, he's just barking because he's excited. I know he looks yeah. scary, but <laughs> he's <just> <laughs> yeah, he's super yeah. excited. <laughs> That's funny. And usually you can tell with body language, but sometimes yeah. sometimes you do get that where it's like the dog is not necessarily aggressive, but their body language almost in a way is pointing that direction because they are just so frustrated. So it's not like mm -hmm. they're aggressive towards the thing they're reacting at. They're almost aggressive towards like the fact that they're on a leash or like they're, mm -hmm. I always like compare it to clients as like, imagine like you're going somewhere that you're really excited to be at, like for that level of reactivity um, where they're excited or they're frustrated that they can't access. If you're driving somewhere and you're like stoked to be there, like it's a concert or whatever, it's something you've been awaiting. And then like all of a sudden you get stuck in like really bad traffic and you're like very frustrated, but you're not, that doesn't necessarily like, you may like react, you might like yell or whatever, whatever people tend to sometimes do in those <laughs> situations, but you're not like an aggressive person. You're just yeah. frustrated. You know? Yeah. Um, that's always how I tend to explain it to people. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and something we, we do a lot here and I love, um, working at the shelter because I learned so many tricks, but, um, enrichment, can we talk a little bit about enrichment? Oh yeah. Enrichment is like, the biggest thing I swear that I do, even though I hardly, it's like only a portion of what I'm doing, but it's like the whole picture a lot of the time. Um, are you um, asking about enrichment for shelter dogs or just in general? Just in general, I think uh, it is important for like the community to know what, what it is and how they can, you know, um, do that with mm -hmm. their pets at home. Cause that's something that I didn't know about. Um, until I worked at the shelter and I learned all of these things oh, yeah. that we do here with our shelter pets. I'm like, hmm, well, maybe I could do that with my pets at home. And I, it has made like a tremendous difference oh, yeah. in, um, you know, their life. So mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. No, at home enrichment is honestly quite simple. Um, I always like to say that your dog is a captive animal inside your home because they are like, yes, they're a domesticated animal but they're still an animal and they are captive because they live inside your house. Um, so you're holding an animal in captivity. Um, yeah. So then we like to think about like the species specific natural behaviors that a dog may display. Um, 
kind of thinking of it almost as like they do in zoos where they're trying to like mimic a natural response or a natural um, behaviors for those animals. Um, so enrichment, of course, is pretty individualized and it can be very specific for a lot of dogs. Um, but species specific behaviors, I always explain like six big main ones um, are chewing, which everyone knows. Everyone knows that dogs have to chew on bones. Like that's the one that I feel like most people know I need to get my dog a bone to chew on. But chewing is a big species specific uh, natural behavior. Um, we also have shredding, dissecting, uh, scavenging, sniffing, digging, and licking are like typically the main ones that I tend to describe. Um, and really a lot of that is uh, like, for example, obviously bones are great for chewing. Um, I typically recommend that people either allow their dogs to dig in their yard uh, or give them like a digging pit or something um, to encourage that behavior in some way, because it is natural. Um, and then typically for scavenging, snuffle mats are really great. Snuffle mats have become very popular nowadays. You can sometimes find them in the pet stores uh, recently, which I've noticed, which we used to not be able to find them there. Uh, but snuffle mats have become much more popularized. Um, that's just to, to do some scavenging. Um, you can also even like make scavenging boxes out of like a cardboard box and packing paper and the dog can like sniff through the paper to find the, the food. Um, shredding and dissecting is a big one that a lot of people skip um because their dog may rip up like a, a stuffed animal and then they're like oh i'm not gonna buy those anymore because uh, the dog just destroyed it they're ungrateful <laughs> um but it is it is a, a predatory behavior so it has to do with the the predation sequence of a dog wanting to like rip up an animal you know like prey animal of some sort mm -hmm. um so I either get like very low cost toys for my dogs to purposely rip up. Sometimes I also go to the dollar store and like grab a couple. And I know that they're probably going to rip them up. And I'm like, that's cool. Like that's what I bought them for. Um, but a lot yeah. of times I do make, uh, I call them DIY carcasses. Um, I have a terrier. <laughs> I, I have a terrier at home. So she loves to rip up stuff. Um, but I'm basically just hiding food in like paper, like packing paper or like small little boxes. And I'm like rolling it up and putting it in like a big box, like a cereal box or even like a like a box that like cans of soda would come in. Um, and I just kind of like hide a bunch of food in the box of the papers. The paper a lot of times feels like it's like mimicking guts in a way. <laughs> and then the dog will like grab the box and rip it open, eat the insides, same way that they may, you know, rip open a prey animal <laughs> and eat yeah. the insides. Um, <laughs> so that's a really big one that I recommend. That's a really big like stress relieving one too. Um, so that one's pretty massive. Um, Sniffing is a huge natural behavior that can be really enriching for dogs as well. Um, sniffing is a dog's primary sense. So they don't really see the world like we do. They tend to smell it. Um, they, ha they have quite a massive nose. Um, so a lot of times I recommend that my clients go on decompression walks, which are walks in nature where the dogs are allowed freedom of movement. So basically you're just taking your dog to maybe a quiet field or we go to um, a cemetery quite often. Um, and I put my dog on like maybe a 30 to 50 foot leash and I quite literally just like follow her around. Like obviously like I'm not following her into traffic. Um, there are rules, but I, I'm, I'm mostly just kind of holding the leash and saying, hey, where do you want to go? Or like we even have a trail system near our area that like is winding and there's lots of options of where to walk. And like instead of me choosing, oh, we're going to go this way, I just let her choose. And then I'm just like following along. Um, so decompression walks can be really, really enriching as well. But really, I just recommend that you find what your dog seems to enjoy doing and stick with that. Some dogs don't really enjoy to strip up stuff, even though some dogs may. Um, it's, it's quite individualized. Um, also, something to consider is the dog's breed. So if you have a specific type of a breed, that might give you information of what types of behaviors they may like to display, what did we breed them for? Um, so really enrichment is just a huge conversation about natural behavior and how we can get a dog to display it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I have two Huskies at home. So okay. um, <laughs> usually around, uh, people probably don't get it, but most uh, animal welfare people are like, oh, Huskies. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah. yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, like you mentioned, you know, the box thing, I, 
Um, usually during the holidays, I, I don't like going shopping anymore because it's just so crazy out there. So I do all oh, my yeah. shopping online. <laughs> but um, my my dogs, they know like, oh, man, it's holiday season because we're getting all these boxes of enrichment. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I have like a whole cabinet in my house that's just filled with like random boxes and like packing paper. <laughs> like any any box I get, I put in this cabinet. And it was so funny because I was on vacation like a couple months ago. I was just like visiting home. And I like was eating something and I it was like came in a little box and I like literally set it aside <laughs> as if I was like at my house, like going to do enrichment with it. I was like, no, I can, I'm supposed to throw this away. <laughs> like I like, couldn't <laughs> physically get myself to like throw away a box because I was so used to like saving them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't even use my recycling bin that much anymore because I just use all these recycled <laughs> items. <laughs> you have recycling machines at home. They're your dogs. They're just exactly. Machines. That's what yeah. I call it. Like they're just they're just like fun appliances that can do other yeah. things. For us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so uh, I know that you have a lot of experience in um, the shelter world. Can you talk, uh, you know, about maybe some some experiences that uh, you've had at in the shelter? Yes, I have a lot of experience <laughs> about the shelter. I don't even know where to start. Um, of course, I initially started at the shelter uh, when I was volunteering. I actually was offered a job at that shelter that I was volunteering at, which was like pretty crazy um, to land that right after I became a dog trainer. Um, yeah. So I did that for two and a half years and then did leave um, due to mental health reasons and then worked at a different shelter here in South Carolina after I moved for about a year and a half. Um, I mostly would do a lot of work with the dogs who are displaying concerning behaviors um, as a behavior <laughs> specialist. Um, so any dogs who are displaying any levels of fear, aggressions, high levels of stress, maybe anxiety, maybe just lack of behavior. We would see a lot of dogs who would just sit in their kennel and not move, not eat, sometimes not even go potty or just go potty like where they were sitting. Um, so I would do a lot of work with them. And a lot of the work that I was doing was more so in the realm of an assessment. So I was kind of answering questions that we didn't have the answers to, such as, can this dog stop being this way? Can this dog come out of their shell? Can they stop being aggressive? Can they stop being so shut down? Can they learn to trust me? Um, and then can we place this dog safely was kind of a big question that I would tend to answer, um, which is quite a large question <laughs> to, to come to terms with. Um, so I would do a lot of assessments with them. Um, and a lot of the assessments had to do with um, me, honestly, just typically like if the dog was very aggressive, um, I would just play a treat retreat type game where you're approaching the dog, you're tossing maybe a big hunk of hot dog or something really delicious and smelly, and then just walking away. And then I would do that like maybe like 30 times. Um, and eventually at some point the dog may come up to the front of the kennel instead of hiding in the back, like anticipating my presence because they know that I'm maybe gonna drop something. Um, and then of course, moving into like, can I get you out of your kennel? Can I handle you? Can I touch you? Are you in any pain? Um, I, of course, wouldn't do any like pain assessments in the sense of like what a vet would do because I'm not a vet, um, but I would typically do like a bit of handling and just kind of like look at their body to see, hey, are you, do you, do I see anything that might notify that you're in some form of pain? So then I would obviously tell the doctor at that point. Um, yeah. And then, of course, testing them with people and other dogs, just kind of trying to check out their general like sociability status, like yes, you're very scared and yes, you're being very upset and aggressive right now. That's that's okay. But can we get past that? And that was kind of what the, the majority of the work that I would do at the shelters. Yeah. And I, I think it's important that you mention that because, you know, there are a lot of um, cases where, um, you know, behavior issues may arise because of an underlying health issue. Oh, yeah, 
Absolutely. I always mention, I feel like I talk about my foster dog, Emily, so much, <laughs> but she is like, she's just so special. But she, um, she had double entropion, meaning that her eyelids were like inside her eyeballs, basically. Um, so when I met her at the shelter, she was like, she was listed for euthanasia the day that I met her just because she was so shut down. She was literally in her panel in the corner with her head <laughs> in the corner. No. And she was just sitting there and she just fully avoided everything that was happening. I did was I was able to get her out. She did do a little bit better at the shelter. Regardless, all these things happened. I decided to take her home for foster because she wasn't going to go anywhere else at the shelter, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And she, same thing here. She was very scared. She was very timid. If she saw my other dog, my actual personal dog, she would just fully avoid her. So I kind of had this assumption that she wasn't social with dogs. Like maybe she just didn't like dogs if you're fully avoiding the other dog. And after she got surgery and her eyes healed, she is like extremely playful. She's not scared. I genuinely thought that she was like maybe semi-feral in some way because of how scared she was. I was like, oh, you've never even like been in a house before. Like you're so scared. Literally the moment she recovered from her surgery, she was like not even the same dog <laughs> because she just wasn't, she just wasn't in pain anymore. And, and she finally maybe felt comfortable and wasn't feeling so, I can't imagine how painful that was to have your eyelids inside of your eyeballs. Um, mm -hmm. I can imagine that that sucked yeah. pretty bad for her. Um, but yeah, now she is very playful. So that's a huge thing is that a lot of dogs, even going back to the topic of like, why we shouldn't be punishing behavior, right? Like if, if it was the other route where instead of avoiding, she was reacting in an aggressive manner because her eyes were so painful and she was so uncomfortable. Um, and then I maybe used punishment and corrected that behavior, then what does that do? Like that's, that's quite, if you think about it on a full spectrum, how unethical that is. Um, but yeah, most dogs um, really display their pain with their behavior l large majority of the time, whether it's lack of behavior or like a, an aggressive or reactive response of some sort. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think it's so important for the community to know that too, because they come, um, you know, saying that their dog is now randomly, you know, showing these behavior issues. And mm. that's, you know, one of the first things we tell them, have you went to a vet um, to yes. double check everything? Because we, you know, it, it's probably yes. not out of nowhere, um, or there's something, something that we need to, to learn about their, you know, oh, yeah. um, environment or their um, health. So, so definitely um, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a large majority of the aggression cases that I tend to get have, have a factor of pain of some sort. Um, <laughs> or even like when I'm doing client intakes and I'm like, oh, I have an, I have a, an aggression inquiry. I'm going to chat with them and I call them on the phone. I'm typically asking like, when did this behavior start occurring? And if it's any like sudden onset, like they're like, oh, just all of a sudden they started acting this way and they, they're really aggressive, then they're required to have like a full vet workup before we even work together. Of course, with some cases, I may still work with them if it sounds more behavioral than medical. Um, but especially for like sudden onset, it's always typically a medical issue. I've had dogs who have had like torn ACLs. There was one dog, I can't remember the condition. It was something, it was um, some form of a condition in their brain. I don't know if it was like a brain tumor or something along those lines, but the dog was unfortunately euthanized um, due to the condition. But it didn't, the dog didn't display any like, like issues in the sense of like, oh, I'm in pain of any form. They acted normal, but all of a sudden they were being extremely aggressive towards the other dog in the house. And it was like a severe mm -hmm. brain tumor of some sort that, that couldn't even be saved. It, it was like so, so extreme to that level. But yeah, it's super important to like know that, that that's how that behavior tends to a lot of times present itself. Yeah, yeah. And um, you also, you know, mentioned the mental health factor. I know here working um, in the shelter can be very stressful. And uh, a lot of time our community, you know, they don't understand the, the pressures yeah. of us, you know, um, putting animals at risk or, or having that, that title. Um, but that's the very last thing that we want to do. Um, you know, yeah. it's a very hard decision. Uh, yes. for us to get to that point. Um, and if you feel comfortable, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how hard it is to, to be in the shelter uh, world and having to come to these hard decisions? Oh, yeah. I love talking about my mental health. <laughs> I love to, <laughs> that gets funny as it sounds, but like just in the sense of like that there are a lot of times we just don't talk about it. A lot mm -hmm. of times too, um, my experiences at the shelter, a lot of people just had that like dead face, 
like us, especially um, like a lot of like the long term animal control officers that I worked alongside, like I, I saw nothing from them because it was so shut off. But I think it's really important to like feel your feelings, of course. <laughs> um, but I've, of course, had like my fair share of mental health issues from the shelter. Um, I actually had to leave my first shelter job for mental health reasons alone. Um, I had developed this like weird, I don't, I probably should have gotten like actual help for it, but I didn't. <laughs> um, but I developed this like weird PTSD almost type response where I was essentially blacking out when I was hearing dogs barking. Um, whether I was at home or at the shelter, um, I would like walk into the kennel room and like the kennel rooms are extremely loud um, for one. And it was just kind of like everything would go blank. Um, and I was like hearing dogs barking as I was falling asleep, like types of stuff like that. Um, but it is, it's it's a really challenging place to be regardless of if you're someone who is more sensitive to things like loud noises or if you're a more empathetic person, which most people in the sheltering world are quite empathetic people. <laughs> they're, they're typically there because they are empathetic people. Um, but it is so challenging and exhausting and heartbreaking and like, honestly horrible if we're being blunt because it no matter what like of course it is very rewarding and it's it's something that is so special at least in my opinion I feel like anytime I've ever been in a shelter it gives me the sense of like belonging in a way like it gives me the sense of like I can make an impact like I have a purpose like I can do this and it does give you those feelings but at the end of the day, you can do whatever you want and you can work as hard as you can and you can get the dogs out of the kennel. You can get them to stop acting aggressively. You can place the dogs in the homes, whatever it might be. But more times than not, at the end of the day, there's still more dogs than kennels. Um, and you typically still have to make a decision whether you like it or not. And I think that that's something that shelter workers tend to get a lot of hate for because hey, we euthanize dogs, or hey, you're a dog killer. I would get that all the time on my Instagram is like, wow, you work at, because the shelter I worked at here in South Carolina was, honestly, their numbers were pretty incredible for a municipal shelter that had both the city and the county um, for like their intake. Mm -hmm. um, but they were still a kill shelter. They have decently higher, you know, euthanasia rates, um, but not really that high. Um, and I would get it all the time that like, oh, I support this. And it's like, I don't, this sucks. <laughs> like, I don't support this. I'm here because I'm trying to help it. And I'm trying to fix it. Um, but a lot of people don't understand that shelter workers don't really have a choice. Shelters don't have a choice when it comes to euthanasia. Um, it's it, like, what truly, what do you do at the end of the day when there are 300 dogs and 280 kennels? Do you take 20 dogs home? Well, I already have a foster dog and I already have my own dog. And hey, all my coworkers also already have foster animals <laughs> and we're all also burnt out and like really not okay. Um, so it's, it's kind of just like this endless horrible circle that you're involved in. Um, but I think it's really important that the people that you work with are kind to you. I, I feel like when, whenever I've struggled the most with my mental health in shelter, uh, it was because the people that I was working with, my coworkers were not nice people or they were not being nice to me, or that's always what tipped it over. Like I'd be feeling not so great. Maybe I would know that, Hey, I'm getting a little fatigued or I'm getting a little tired. And then all of a sudden like drama sparks up and you're like, I just, I cannot handle this <laughs> anymore. It's like, that's like the last thing that any shelter worker needs is either like drama within the shelter or people being mean to each other or the public being mean to you as well. Um, both of those things are going to burn out your shelter worker immediately. And a lot of times there are cases where like shelter workers don't ever go back into shelters because of those situations, uh, because it is so painful. Yeah. And I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, but like you said, I, at least me, I, I feel like I belong here too and, and that I can really make an impact. So yeah. um, we're hoping the future is better. <laughs> Hopefully. There's, yeah, yeah it's, there, it's so like, because I always get the question too is like, how do we resolve the issue? Because the issue is just like, there's an obnoxious amount of um, dogs that are uh, not wanted, if you will, or not in a home. And it's just a constant cycle. 
Um, so it's, it's really just getting to the bottom of how can we stop the issue at hand? How can we stop this like overpopulation crisis? Um, and it's a lot of times it's not like a lot of people are like, oh, ban breeding. But in my opinion, breeding is important, especially if it's being done well. <laughs> I think there are, of course, like obviously there's breeding that's being done poorly and that's why dogs are in shelters, but you don't see well-bred dogs that are typically purebred or have come from a good breeder ending up in shelter systems. It's typically dogs who were either backyard bred or bred on the streets, or it's like pregnant mama from the streets now has puppies in the shelter type of a thing. Um, of course you do get purebred dogs in the shelter, but in most cases you're not getting a dog who comes from an ethical breeder to be in a shelter. It's, it's typically just not the norm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and earlier you mentioned that, um, you have your own, um, business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I own, um, a business here in Columbia, South Carolina, but I do do virtual consulting worldwide. So it's kind of just like, I own a business everywhere, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> um, but I consult, um, primarily behavioral issues. Um, so the large majority of my clients are dealing with either an aggression or a reactivity issue. Um, however, I do also do really everything um, other than severe separation anxiety cases. I typically find that people are better off with a specialist <laughs> for a severe <laughs> separation anxiety uh, you know, case, um, which I'm not, I'm not a specialist in that. Um, but so I'm primarily consulting with that, but I will do like, I also sometimes get dogs that just like want to learn like a recall or just like how to learn on how to walk on a leash or something like that. Um, but really it's um, my full-time job, of course. So I fully own and operate it. I have a few apprentices who will hopefully become maybe trainers. So I'll have some extra help. Um, but outside of that, um, I do fully do everything myself, um, including like admin work, client intake notes, and of course the actual consulting. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, you're, you're awesome for for doing all of that. And I hope that our uh, community, um, because you offer it virtually, will maybe um, check out your, your um, company because there are a lot of people here, you know, looking for training. Um, but here in El Paso, uh, like you said, you know, it's not really regulated. So I think that's important to to oh, go with yeah. somebody that <laughs> that has, you know, the, the education to back it up. And um, so I really would hope that the, the community maybe reaches out to you for for any um, help that they might need. Yeah, I would love that. You can always refer me out to people. I'm also, um, it's not like lunch yet. So I haven't really been talking about it too much because it's not even like soft lunch. Um, but <laughs> I'm in the process of creating this like online, uh, basically like courses, uh, books, guides, things like that, which will be very low cost and easily accessible. Um, and it will, of course, you, you can't do behavior modification like um, on a blanket uh, way, right? So you can't like just say, oh, every dog who's dealing with this issue, this will resolve that because behavior is a study of one, but it will be pretty just like cut and dry, like general, like, oh, your dog is displaying this behavior. Like what are some things that may potentially ease that? Because maybe you don't have the resources to work with, with me. Maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you don't have whatever it might be. Um, so it will be something where people can log on and take at least a course to give them some insight about why their dog might be, be behaving a certain way, or they can even log on and, and um, get something like help with teaching a recall or something super basic as well like that. Um, so that will be definitely something I'll be launching and there will be a lot of shelter dog things in there. <laughs> of course, there'll be a ton of like, you just adopted a dog from a shelter. What are we going to do now? Um, but hopefully that will be released um, maybe about mid-fall. Hopefully. I keep saying like, oh, September. And then I get to September. I'm like, it's not done yet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's getting there. Um, so, yeah. So that should be a really nice resource that people can um, dive into if, if they feel like they need some help but can't maybe commit to working with somebody. Oh, that's amazing. That's that's a really great idea, you know, to have those resources uh, readily available for people um, to get more insight on, on you know, what could be, you know, triggering their, their pets. So I think that's amazing. Um, that's awesome. I can't wait yeah. to see that. I'm excited. I'll send I'll have to send you the link. 
for yes, yes. I finally release it. <laughs> <laughs> no rush. I know it's it's a lot of work to, you know, put all that together and and um I you know, it's it's uh going to be amazing, I'm sure. Um well, is there anything else that you would like to to um mention about um your your um trainings or just in general about, you know, the shelter environment, um, positive reinforcement, no. force free? Not really. I mean, I think we said mostly everything really. Um, I commend all shelter workers. I know how hard that is. So if you are, of course, listening and you're working in a shelter, um, I hope that shelter workers at least feel like they do matter in some way, even though it's really hard to feel like you matter in a world like that when like nothing that you do really fixes it. Um, I hope that they at least know that they matter to the, the individual dogs that they are able to help because that's really important. Maybe that they can't, maybe we cannot save all of the dogs, right? Like I'm being super like corny here, but like, I think it is like very, very noble to, to be able to at least make an impact on one dog, even if your only impact was offering them some sense of security, even if you know that maybe the dog isn't going to make it out of the shelter and maybe this is it for them. Maybe you, you were able to offer them, you know, an hour or even a minute of calm peace where they were able to relax with you or eat some cookies or play a game or just get out of their kennel. Um, I think that alone is something that a lot of times we forget about as shelter workers because it's not the big picture. It's like the smallest one possible. Um, but it is, I think it's really impactful. Even if like the dogs, of course, can't tell you how impactful it is, but I'm sure that they would if they could. Yes, yes, that's that's uh, very, very important to remember that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's amazing, especially for, you know, our sh any shelter worker, really. Um, like you said, it's so easy to get burnt out in this environment. And hearing that from someone that is not a part of our team, I'm sure will will give um, some sense of uh, belonging here in in our uh, shelter. So <laughs> thank you. you know, thank you for that. Um, well, if, if there's nothing else, we, we really want to um, thank you for, for joining us and taking the time out of your schedule um, to uh, record this this episode. I think it's going to um, be really beneficial for our community to hear it from someone other than, you know, our, our, our local uh, shelter. So, um, <laughs> uh, so we thank you so much for, for joining us, Jenna, and thank you for all of your, your work. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, uh, a lot of our workers here are, are your fan um, for all of the amazing work that you're doing. And we, we truly appreciate um, the changes that you're making in, in uh, pets' lives and, and, you know, in the, the community that you're at as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means so much, honestly. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us for another episode of EPAS Unleashed. Um, you can uh, go ahead and share, like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Oh, oh, oh.